Excellent. Thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, for all of our members joining us. I'm Deanna Phelan, president of the New Brunswick Equestrian Association. Um, happy this evening to welcome Dr. Kathleen McMillan, uh, assistant professor at the Atlantic Veterinary College um, in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island, to share with us, our members, um, some information as we're all starting to ramp up for horse show season or people are buying and selling horses. Horses are going to start moving across Canada and uh, from the U.S. as well. And something that's um, hit our industry hard um, all over the world is something called the herpes virus. So I thought as we're all getting ready to um, pack up and start moving around, hopefully, we should get a little bit more information about how serious this is um, for our herd health in New Brunswick. And as we're all hopefully getting ready to do our vaccines uh, this spring, what, which vaccine should we be getting if we want to stay ahead of the herpes virus? So um, welcome, Kathleen. Thanks for joining us on this Sunday evening. And uh, we're going to turn the presentation over to you to um, get some helpful information. Thanks, Deanna. I appreciate you inviting me to speak to tonight. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to share some information on herpes virus, hopefully alleviate some fears and give you some information so that you can make informed decisions as to the care of your horses. So, unfortunately, I don't have the ability to uh, advance my slides, so I will need help with that. <laughs> Certainly, herpes virus has been in the media a lot. Um, just like COVID, herpes has hit the equine industry quite hard, and there's been outbreaks in Europe Ontario and Quebec, certainly they're a little closer to home, but it has created a lot of, I think, anxiety in people. And, um, you know, it, it is something that we need to keep in mind when we are planning our vaccination schedules for our horses. And also, as Deanna said, when horses are moving, when we're bringing new horses into our barn. So those are some of the things that we're going to talk about tonight. So what is herpes virus? It's a virus, it's highly contagious. And in the equine world, there are nine types of EHVs or equine herpes virus. The most common ones that we need to be concerned about are one and four. So worldwide, there's 130 herpes viruses um, that are in, there's nine in humans, nine in horses, and the rest are in other animals. So it is something that is uh, widespread in various species. For most horses, they're gonna be affected at a very young age. Most horses will have come into contact with herpes virus by the age of two, but many actually will be um, affected when they're very young, when they're foals. And most horses will get through these first couple of years and throughout their life without having any serious complications or any kind of serious clinical disease. But certainly some horses are more severely affected than others. It's really interesting because the virus becomes latent or inactive in the body. So approximately 60% of horses will be carriers of herpes virus throughout their lifetime. And the issue with this is that the latent virus can become reactivated during times of intense stress. So whether that's uh, strenuous exercise during kind of an intense training program, kind of as you're ramping up for the show season, long distance travel, so a horse maybe that is shipping from Florida um, or to Florida, uh, certainly showing because you are uh, you know, trucking from uh, different venues. And there's a lot of horses that come from different places and they're all kind of congregated or intensely housed in, in one facility for a period of time. And of course, during times of immunosuppression. So if a horse is sick with um, another virus or bacterial infection, then potentially that could create enough stress that this herpes virus would um, reactivate. So for those who are more visually um, kind of focused, I thought that this was a good diagram and I'll see if I can write on it. Great. 
So we have herpes at infection in a foal or adult horse. And over time, that infection becomes latent. And then the horse basically can go on and, you know, be very normal, not show any clinical signs. But then you have this period of stress where it will reactivate and then the horse becomes infected again. And the concern is that at that point, that horse is going to be contagious to other horses. And you can compare that to yourself if you are someone who is unfortunately very prone to cold sores and cold sores are a uh, human herpes uh, simplex virus. So um, you may have a cold sore, then it goes away, but then during really stressful time, like exams or uh, you're really busy at work, that can become reactivated and then you get another cold sore. So that is kind of another way to look at it. Whoops, and look at that. Looks like all my drawings are... <laughs> we'll try not to do that anymore. So, as I mentioned, there are nine different types of EHV in horses. The one that we're most concerned about, or the two that we're most concerned about, are EHV1, uh, which is also known as rhinopneumonitis, and EHV4. So, the concern with EHV1 is that it does cause respiratory disease, um, but it can also cause abortion. And more recently in the media, we're hearing a lot about the neurologic disease that's associated with EHV1, um, which is also known as EHM. It can also cause neonatal death. So that would be a foal that um, would be very young and um, they are, they don't tend to have quite a, the same immune response and can also um, unfortunately be very affected by the EHV and can end up dying from that as well. As far as EHV4, it most commonly causes respiratory disease and will rarely cause abortion or um, neurologic disease. So uh, that is not as big a concern, but certainly with uh, our vaccines, they cover EHV1 and 4. So transmission. Whenever we're dealing with a disease which is contagious or communicable, um, you can't really fight it until you know how it, how it happens. So for transmission of the HV, it's most commonly through direct horse-to-horse -horse contact. So those are horses and that picture in the top that are touching noses. Um, they may come in contact with the nasal discharge of an infected horse or also through infected air droplets. Um, so if a horse is coughing or sneezing up to 15 feet, some people estimate even up to 45 that um, potentially that could cause uh, transmission of the disease. So similar to COVID, you know, that's why we're wearing masks now. Um, horses can't wear masks, but certainly you want to try to maintain the social distance as much as possible. The other thing to keep in mind is that a horse can be, when they're sick, uh, they can still shed the virus for up to 14 days, um, even if they're not showing symptoms after, you know, seven or eight days, they can still shed the virus for a little while. So it's important that um, you kind of keep your your sick horses isolated and away from your healthy horses uh, at least for two weeks, but uh, probably closer to three or four if you want to be uh, really sure. Another mode of transmission that um, is important in breeding farms would be a mare who has a, an EHV1 uh, abortion. So the aborted foal, as well as any fluids um, that um, were released when that foal was, was born can also act as a source of infection. So it's really important in breeding farms that 
anytime there is an abortion that that mare be separated from other mares because she can be um, a cause of infection and potentially uh, result in the abortion of other mares as well. So even though stress does not uh, cause transmission, obviously, but it can certainly enhance the uh, transmission of, of the disease. So during periods of stress, such as transportation, uh, weaning is a very stressful time for young foals, showing um, any of these things can increase stress and more likely cause reactivation of the virus within the horse and lead to spread of the disease. Another important um, form of transmission that we need to keep in mind are something called fomites. And basically that is when inanimate objects um, such as clothing, hands, uh, water buckets, feed tubs, uh, grooming equipment, anything like that can actually cause transmission of the vi virus because the virus can surfaces for a week or more, um, kind of depending on the situation or the, you know, it, it has to do with humidity and surface contact and viral load and that kind of thing. But um, the point is that we can actually transmit the virus from horse to horse, from stable to stable. So that is really important to keep in mind. And we need to, um, you know, have good biosecurity practices. So similar to COVID, once again, you know, we're doing uh, frequent hand washing, using hand sanitizer. Um, you're keeping your, your circle small and, uh, you know, you're not uh, uh, burn hopping <laughs> so much. So yeah, it's just important to keep that in mind. The good news is that uh, disinfectants uh, will, most disinfectants will kill a virus. So we certainly can uh, be very diligent with our biosecurity and hopefully help prevent spread of disease. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about the the most common uh, forms that we see. So uh, respiratory abortion and of course the neurologic form, which is uh, I think what we're all a little scared about. I know certainly I am as a veterinarian and as a horse owner as well. Um, as far as the respiratory uh, side of EHV is something that I see a lot. You know, it, it certainly endemic within our populations and it tends to affect younger horses. So usually horses, I want to say under the age of four, but um, certainly a lot of my younger two and three-year-old patients are seem to be more prone to developing respiratory signs. Typically these signs will show um, four to six days after exposure to the virus, but it can be as, as early as one day or as long as 10 days. So that's why we need to kind of um, keep in mind that incubation period. Just because your horse isn't showing a snotty nose a couple of days after it was exposed to another horse that had a snotty nose doesn't mean that it's not going to get it. So you still want to keep in mind, you know, that kind of 10 to 14 day window before you're really out of the woods. Most horses will present with a mild fever. So anything over 101.5. Uh, Fahrenheit or 38.6 Celsius. However, fevers can get quite high, um, around 104 or 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, a lot of horses will have uh, coughing. It may just be kind of a mild, mild cough and of course nasal discharge. And usually when this um, virus starts initially, the discharge is going to be clear. Um, there's not going to be any color. It's going to be kind of watery with a little, maybe a little bit of kind of thickness to it. But over time that can progress to a thicker, um, kind of more yellow nasal discharge. And in some of these horses, they end up developing a secondary bacterial infection. So that is something that uh, certainly is important to keep in mind as well. Oh. I was supposed to give you a little uh, warning that there was going to be a graphic picture in this slide. Uh, my apologies. 
Um, and of course, for, for breeding operations, abortion is something that is very concerning. And usually abortions in uh, mares that are affected with EHV will happen after the eighth month of gestation or pregnancy. And usually it'll occur within two to 12 weeks after they've been exposed to the virus. So the problem is that most mares are not gonna show you any outward signs that they are sick or that they have um, been exposed to the virus. Usually what happens is that there's going to be a spontaneous abortion in that mare. And very often you will see um, what we call like an abortion storm. So you may have several mares on a farm that uh, end up aborting in a fairly short time frame. One way to prevent this is um, to vaccinate. And vaccinations are very effective in fruit mares um, to prevent abortion. And generally we'll do a, a three series vaccination at five, seven, and nine months of their pregnancy. And then we have EHM, and this is the neurologic form, and it stands for equine herpes myelencephalopathy. Um, so we're just going to call it EHM for short. But this is the one that 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 is is very concerning, and this is what has been going on in Europe. Um, I believe there have been eighteen deaths in Europe. Uh, there have been multiple cases. I think up to possibly nine cases in Ontario as of last week is uh, what I found in my research and uh, positive cases in Quebec as well. So with EHM, it can be an isolated case, but you can also have an outbreak uh, which can affect multiple horses, um, certainly can expose multiple horses. And the concerning thing is that the outbreak may or may not necessarily Necessarily be associated with a respiratory outbreak. I mean, it's one thing if you see horses in a stable with, you know, fevers and snotty noses, you kind of, you know, you know that they're sick and you know that um, there's a potential that other horses in the stable will um, get sick with similar symptoms. However, with EHM, sometimes it is fairly um, sudden. It seems like it kind of comes out of the blue. And when it does happen, then every horse at, at that facility is going to be at risk. And it's of greatest concern at um, highly intensive um, areas. So racetracks where you have a lot of young horses um, and there's a lot of horses kind of coming and going same as boarding facilities. You may not have as many young horses, but certainly uh, there's a lot of traffic, um, you know, coming and going within that facility. And of course, horse shows where you have horses coming from all over the place and uh, bringing whatever they've been exposed to, to that uh, facility. And of course, stress, which comes with training, uh, with transportation and with showing. So those things can all kind of sometimes uh, create the perfect storm basically for EHM to set up and wreak its havoc. So neurologic signs will usually appear around seven days post-infection and often it's just after a fever breaks and with herpes you'll get these um, what we call undulating fevers. So the fever will come, then it will go, and then it kind of comes back as well. The thing is that the neurologic signs will progress very rapidly over a day or two. Um, you may see, think that the horse just isn't quite right, and then very quickly the horse can end up being um, very neurologic and recumbent and unable to rise. So. I think that that is something that a lot of owners find very scary. Veterinarians uh, certainly find uh, very scary as well. In an outbreak of EHM, um, up to 10% of the horses could develop EHM. And the mortality rate, and this is where it gets really scary, 
is between 20 to 80% of those horses that end up getting sick. So um, a lot of horses, you know, they may not recover from this and they may not recover to be the same horse that they were before they got sick because they may have some long lasting neurologic deficits that may continue beyond the actual um, period of illness. So I think that that's important to keep in mind as well. So the clinical signs of EHM. The first one is ataxia, which just means um, in coordination and weakness. So if you think of, uh, you know, the drunken sailor or someone who, who's had a few too many beers on a Friday night, uh, they can't, they can, will not pass the sobriety test. So they cannot walk in a straight line. Um, and horses with EHM are gonna be very similar. They'll have a hard time uh, being able to walk in a straight line. Uh, there's a lot of weakness, especially in their hind limbs. Um, they can become so weak that they tend to just kind of lean against a wall or fence just in order to support their weight. Uh, one of the hallmark signs of EHM is, has to do with their urinary system and specifically their bladder. And they may, uh, they may not actually urinate, but they may just dribble urine. So that is something that we uh, look at as well. And sometimes they'll lose um, what we call tail tone, which means basically that they just can't poop. Um, so in horses that are very sick, um, you end up having to catheterize their bladder to help alleviate uh, the pressure in their bladder and uh, remove the urine as well as the uh, manure in their rectum. For horses that become uh, severely affected, they are often just so weak and uncoordinated that they can't stand. And the horse in this picture is dog sitting. And that is exactly, they're just sitting like a dog because they're actually too weak to stand. Occasionally, some horses will show signs of uh, brain disease and they'll have a head tilt. They be can become profoundly depressed as well. Uh, but for the most part, they're going to be ataxic, unable to urinate, and they will dog sit. So those are the um, signs that we, we look for. So I guess the question is why how can one virus cause so many bad things? You know, like you have uh, a two-year-old that has a respiratory disease, a broodmare that has just aborted in a nine-month-old foal or fetus, and then you have another horse that um, has become neurologic. And for the, the problem is that the virus can, because it becomes latent and it can actually spread throughout the body very quickly and can end up um, causing problems in different systems within the body. But specifically for EHM, it ends up causing inflammation of the blood vessels and the spinal cord and the brain. And this inflammation can end up causing uh, small blood clots or microvascular blood clots. It causes a vasculitis where basically blood flow to the spinal cord and the brain is um, impaired. And, and in doing that, it ends up causing neurologic signs. So some, you know, and the question is why do some horses get it and some don't? And it, it's complicated. You know, why do some people uh, get severe effects with COVID and others do not? So it's a combination of factors and a lot of it really has to come down to the individual animal and the immune status of that animal, the strain of EHV. So the neurotropic strain, there's two different strains of EHV. One, uh, one is thought to perhaps more likely cause EHM 
uh, but it doesn't mean that the other one doesn't. It's just that uh, when we think of EHM, uh, we think more of the neurotropic strain. And of course, the viral load. Um, if the horse is exposed to uh, just a tiny bit of a virus, then they're probably not going to get as sick as if they were exposed to um, a heavy, a heavy load of the virus. So the diagnosis, um, basically, you know, we know when I, if I see a horse that is a toxic and is dog sitting and urine dribbling, you know, it, my, my brain is going to go to EHV, um, EHM. However, uh, you cannot make a definitive diagnosis just on the clinical signs especially in a situation um, such as EHV. So we really need to do some diagnostic tests. Um, uh, the gold standard would be virus isolation. And that's where we take a nasal swab, which is um, shown in, in this image on the right, and also a blood sample. And we'll test both of those samples. And it's important that you actually test both samples, not just one or the other. Of course, that doubles your cost, but um, and that is what is recommended in the consensus statement for managing EHV. And we will try to detect the virus by PCR, which is polymerase chain reaction. So that is now what is considered to be the gold standard. We can also diagnose it by doing blood serum titers. Um, and that is where you take one sample you measure the uh, titer of EHV, and then you take another sample two to three or four weeks afterwards, and you should see a, four, a four-fold increase in the titer. And then there may be other horses that um, unfortunately are not diagnosed until necropsy. And so necropsy, which is what we call an autopsy in an animal, should be performed on any horse that uh, dies or is euthanized if they're showing uh, signs of neurologic disease. And that's important to give you a definitive, not just to give you a definitive diagnosis of what is going on in that horse, but also to help protect other horses that you may have um, in your herd, in your boarding stable, um, because if you do have something as contagious as EHV, um, especially the uh, neurologic form, then you certainly want to know that so that you can take proper measures. So treatment, and this is this is a hard slide <laughs> for me to talk about because uh, the, the truth is that there is no, there's no real treatment. There's no specific treatment that is going to cure EHV. So there's no magic bullet. Um, all we can do uh, for a horse that is sick, whether it's with respiratory illness or with uh, the neurologic form, is to provide supportive care. Um, certainly there's medications such as NSAIDs, so that would be your butyrbanamine, that is going to help with fever, inflammation, with pain. Um, there are other drugs as well uh, that can help reduce the clotting, but often the clotting has already, that kind of clotting cascade has already started and has caused damage. And that is what you were seeing in the neurologic symptoms. Uh, for horses that aren't drinking well um, or eating well, then we can certainly provide IV fluids and nutrition through a nasogastric tube uh, that's passed up their nose and down into their stomach. And for horses that aren't able to urinate or uh, pass manure, then we'll have to uh, relieve the pressure on those. Otherwise, the bladder may actually uh, rupture and that's going to cause other problems. So the, the horse that's uh, pictured here on the slide is a horse that uh, has EHM. And this horse is, is actually suspended in a sling. So this is a horse that is recumbent, uh, which means the horse is down and uh, unable to stand on its own. And horses, they don't do well on bed rest. They, um, they don't do well if they're laying down and can't get up. And that's why we have so many problems with horses with uh, 
healing fractures and um, and that kind of thing. So for horses that are really sick, then certainly a sling is uh, very helpful trying to keep that horse supported and on its feet for as long as possible. There's other treatments such as antibiotics, um, which is certainly because this is a virus an antibiotic is not gonna cure it um, by any means. But if you do have a horse that has a respiratory infection that potentially has gone from that kind of clear nasal discharge to that thick yellow, you know, gross stuff, then uh, that horse may have a secondary bacterial infection and antibiotics could be beneficial in that situation. Steroids may be beneficial um, as far as inflammation, but they are a little bit controversial as are antiviral medications. Um, so antiviral medications, if given early enough, uh, could benefit the horse, but certainly by the time the horse is down and I'm able to rise, then they're uh, not gonna be beneficial in that situation. <clears throat> so disease prevention. And I think that this is something that uh, is important, not just for EHV, but for strangles, you know, and uh, influenza. So for a lot of diseases, and it is, Basic, it is just good practice or best practice um, that we want to keep in mind. So ideally, when you have a new horse coming into your barn, you want to isolate that horse for three to four weeks. Um, I like this picture, which I got off the internet, but basically I, I'm looking at this gray horse right in the middle. So when you bring a new horse into the barn, Ideally, you don't want to stick it right in the middle because that horse could be contagious with all sorts of things. You just don't know. Um, in a perfect world, you know, we'd all have an isolation barn or quarantine barn, but that's just not practical. So even if you bring a, a new horse into the barn, if you can kind of isolate them in an end stall, preferably have an empty stall uh, between that horse and the horses that are uh, typically in your barn, and that would be certainly preferable than putting the horse right in the middle. Uh, require proof of vaccination. So, uh, you know, if, if horses have been vaccinated recently, uh, if they're up to date in their vaccines, if they've been vaccinated appropriately for appropriate diseases, then that is certainly something that uh, would be very helpful. Uh, keeping groups small. <laughs> so just like with humans with COVID right now, we're cohorting as much as possible. So uh, if you have, um, you know, six different paddocks and try to keep the same horses together every day is another thing that is very helpful. Minimize stress as much as possible. Taking rectal temperatures. Uh, fever is, is always your, well, I shouldn't say always your best indicator, but it is a good indicator of uh, disease and for early detection. So in a perfect world, you take that twice a day because the temperature will naturally rise and fall throughout the day. Um, so ideally you would want to take it twice a day, but you know, at least once a day would be beneficial. And vaccinate. So if you can vaccinate the majority of your horses, then you can establish herd immunity. Um, certainly for herpes virus, you do want to vaccinate for EHV1 and 4. Uh, vaccinating your pregnant broodmares um, is helpful as well, as well as vaccinating the barren mares, um, not necessarily with the pneumobort or whatever anti-abortion vaccine that you're using, but if you vaccinate them for each HV1 and 4 um, for your respiratory form would be beneficial as well. Um, and hopefully that will decrease the uh, frequency and severity of the respiratory disease in the burn. What is important to keep in mind that there's no vaccine for the neurologic form of herpes. Um, the vaccines that we have just are not uh, predictably uh, preventable for EHM, but the theory is that if you decrease the respiratory form, then hopefully you won't see as much of the neurologic form as well.
So for outbreak management, um, the most important thing I think is to have an early diagnosis. So if you suspect that your horse could potentially have EHV, um, especially the neurologic form, then you want to contact your veterinarian as soon as possible. Maybe not three o'clock in the morning, but you know, eight o'clock in the morning would be okay. Um, certainly if they're showing neurologic signs during the night, then I would consider that to be an emergency situation. Uh, your veterinarian will determine the uh, appropriate sampling and testing to do on your horse. Um, taking rectal temperatures of all horses in the stable twice a day. And what that will do is that it will help you kind of detect those horses that are starting to get sick. And then when you do find a horse with a fever, then you want to isolate that horse from other horses within your barn so that um, it will hopefully minimize the spread of disease. And you can further uh, decrease the spread by having good biosecurity. Um, you know, uh, for yourself, you can wear coveralls, wash your hands, um, use hand sanitizer. Um, if you do have an infected horse in your barn, then work on the healthy horses before you work on the um, sick horse kind of um, towards the end of the day. Stop movement of horses and people as well in your stable. You don't want to be having horses coming and going off your property and you want to minimize the number of people that are going to come into contact as well. And um, of course, isolate your clinical cases. As far as management of clinical cases, as I said before, all we can really do is provide supportive care as needed and um, certainly isolating broodmares that have aborted. The question is, when is your barn going to be clear? And um, ideally, you would still want to quarantine for 28 days after uh, the clinical signs, or after the last horse has, uh, has not shown any more clinical signs. And that number will vary a little bit, um, depending on uh, the source that you're reading uh, on the internet. And I think it also depends whether your barn is vaccinated as well. So there's some things that maybe could speed that up a little bit, but certainly if you're dealing with a neurologic um, outbreak, then you're going to probably want to wait the, the 28 days. So I just have some references there. Uh, there's a lot of great information on the internet. Um, there's a lot of really poor information on the internet. So uh, my advice is when you're, when you're looking for that information, try to find reputable sources, such as the American Association of Equine Practitioners, the Ontario um, Ministry of uh, Food and Agriculture, I believe it is, OMAFRA, um, and also just look for current. Um, when I was researching for the talk, I found a lot of kind of more outdated um, websites. So uh, try to find something that is more current. Um, FEI uh, has some good information there as well. And of course, talk to your veterinarian. Excellent. All right, Kathleen, you've been a, a wealth of information and now we're going to um, take some um, questions from our uh, viewers that have joined us by Zoom and also um, live by um, Facebook. So I'll ask uh, Nancy if you've got any questions on your end. Um, I do. One is asking about uh, EHM and if that is a reportable disease in Canada. It is not. Uh, so, yeah, I know. <laughs> we, we are pushing for it to become reportable in Prince Edward Island. And uh, hopefully our government is moving towards that. It is not considered reportable. It is considered what they call annually notifiable. So uh, basically Canada as a nation has to tell the WHO that they have had um, equine herpes virus within within the country, but it is not notifiable. I think that most people um, are very open and honest about it. And 
there is um, the ECDCC website is, or EDCC, it's, it's very good. And uh, so I think that most people are pretty good about reporting it, but it is not required to report. So the cases that we're hearing about from Ontario and Quebec, those have just been voluntarily shared voluntary. with the media and mm -hmm. there could well be many more cases happening, is that true? Yeah, yeah it, it is certainly possible. However, I think with social media and all of the um, anxiety, you know, and stress surrounding EHM, um, I would expect if there were a, a lot more cases, we would be hearing about it. Right. Hope so. And I think that most veterinarians are very, uh, you know, very diligent with these things. Right. Um, I have a question about dog sitting. Um, I've seen photographs of owners um, that owners have shared of their horses dog sitting in a pasture and it's a joke. It's funny. Are there other times that that behavior can be seen in horses? Um, I mean, all horses, I suppose, can roll and get partially up and sit for a few yeah. seconds. But is that ever a symptom of something else besides um, EHM? I, I had a horse that used to dog sit and pull his blanket off over his head. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I, 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 it's not normal horse behavior, but certainly we can see it. Where we have to be more concerned is when we're seeing other signs that would be considered neurologic. So the horse that's dog sitting and just can't get up. Mm. then, you know, that certainly is, is concerning. If they're doing it out in the field and it's kind of, you know, cute and, and funny, yeah. that's one thing. But um, if, they're, if they're unable to get out of that position, then that's when we really need to worry. Right. Um, how common is rhino in our area? The respiratory oh, form. The respiratory form, um, they estimate that uh, at least 60% of horses have had it at some point. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that it's probably even higher than that. Really? So yeah, yeah, I think, especially I deal with a lot of racehorses and uh, boarding stables. And when one horse gets sick, it tends to pass through very quickly. So I think it is probably more prevalent than we, when we realize. The thing is that we, we get a little complacent about it. You know, because we, we see horses all the time that are kind of getting snotty noses. So we're not necessarily testing and owners don't necessarily want to pay for the testing mm -hmm. um, because it, it, is exp it gets expensive. Um, but I, I think it's definitely here. I, I do not believe that EHM is very common in our area. I remember back in 2004, I think there were two cases in Truro, um, but it's, it doesn't mean that it can't. And right. so I think that that's, that's what we're seeing in other places. And certainly I think we need to be very aware of that. And um, I always tell my clients that they know their horse better than I do. And when you're, you know, when you know your horse, you're, you're looking at their nose every day, you're taking their temperature, then that's certainly, mm -hmm. Um, can be an early indication of any problems. Very good. Deanna, do you have questions coming through from Facebook? Yes, I've got one. It says, um, should draft horses receive this vaccine? I've heard differing opinions. I assume that's the rhino shot. Yeah, I think all horses. So whether it's a miniature horse to a draft horse, and it's actually the same dose. Right, okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> And then also, um, so we've had a, a chat with Dr. Mellish earlier about uh, vaccines. So maybe one of our um, viewers wanted to know what the recommended, uh, if you were going to start going to horse shows this mm -hmm. spring, um, what would be your list of vaccines that you would make sure that you were checking off that your horse had? Well, it's, it's going to be, I guess, depend where you live. So let's um, say Brunswick. Yeah, New Brunswick. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Feed up to the audience, right? <laughs> um, certainly your uh, herpes virus, your one in four, tetanus, 
typically I'll do the encephalitis as well, whether it's part of a five-way vaccine yeah. or I'll do a three-way on top of my Calvin's vaccine. Uh, rabies is certainly going to be important in New Brunswick. It's perhaps less of a fear factor here in PEI, but in New Brunswick, I think that that is important as well. West Nile virus is another, vi another virus that we're not seeing here, but certainly um, we had it two crows here two years ago. Um, so I think it's probably just a matter of time before we see that. So West Nile is something that you may want to consider as well, although it's maybe not as high on the list. And then the other one would be strangles. Um, you know, if you've dealt with strangles, you realize just how miserable it can be. And so that is another, that is what we call a risk-based vaccine um, as opposed to a core vaccine. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a question for, so that, that gray horse that was on your slide that was in that sling, um, mm -hmm. would that gray horse survive and, and would it live in a normal life or that's, it's basically on its way out? So the, the prognosis for recovery is going to be lower for a horse that's unable to rise and support their own weight. So right. certainly they can survive, but I would consider them to be higher in the mortality. So probably closer to the 80 or more percent than, than a horse that uh, is just doing a little bit of dog sitting. Right. Or the, yeah. And, and what about a couple of the tests? They said that the, um, the swabs came back positive but the blood came back negative so what does that mean on some of the testing procedures that happen or would so basically your swab would be positive and the blood work would be positive or, or could there be a difference there could be a difference um, and that's why they recommend doing both the swab and the blood um, they also the testing can be complicated and the problem is that because 60 percent or more horses can be carriers they, if you just tested a hundred, you know, if you tested a hundred horses in your barn, or let's say 10 horses, then six of them may come back as being positive in spite of the fact that they don't have clinical disease. So that's why they don't recommend doing kind of like widespread surveillance um, for testing. But certainly for horses that are sick, that are showing respiratory or neurologic symptoms, then you do want to do both the swab and the blood. Right. Because one comes back negative does not necessarily mean that uh, they aren't, in fact, positive, and that's why they recommend doing both. Okay. Very good. All right. And Nancy, I'm good on um, Facebook. Do you have any more questions from Zoom? Uh, just one. Um, they're asking about thermometers. Um, taking temperature twice a day was one of the recommended prevention and care uh, routines. Do you have a suggestion or recommendation for the type of thermometer? I've seen people using human, I've seen them using digital, I've seen them using the great big old fashioned glass ones with the loop on the end <laughs> that you can tie a string to. What's your They're preference? <laughs> um, honestly, we use a human digital thermometer um, in the hospital. Um, Although I'll, I'll tell you on it, there's a little sticker that says, wait for 20 seconds after the beep. So uh, I find people are a little, um, you know, as soon as it beeps, they like to take it out and read it, but you yeah. do want to wait maybe 20 or 30 seconds after the beep has finished before you actually read the temperature. It's probably not going to change that much, but um, that is the, the ideal way to do it. Um, the other thing that you want to do if you are monitoring temperatures twice a day, you want to try to make that as close to 12 hours as possible. So whether it's seven in the morning and seven in the evening. Um, it's not always practical, but uh, you know, it's do as I say, not as I do type of thing. Yeah. But um, that is what is recommended. That's great. That's helpful. Thank you. That's it for me, Deanna. Okay, perfect. Well, I, Kathleen, I want to thank you for your time. Um, I think it's a great reminder to all of our stable owners and horse owners to take a leadership role and promoting you know, good herd health through vaccines and of course, isolating new horses that come onto the property. 
and um, you know you've left us uh, with with a, with good knowledge and it's a scary stuff out there now and I think that we can only yeah. uh, you know just be mindful and and be good caretakers to the horses that we have and if you're having horse shows or if you own a barn you or you have a horse that goes to a barn you need to ask lots of questions and you need to make sure that um, you know the herd is taken care of as, as best as possible so um, I thank you for sharing your insight onto that and I um, look forward to having you come back to New Brunswick sometime hopefully in a couple of weeks <laughs> okay, take care. thanks everyone thanks you very much good night bye